we're all here. Vicky's name tag is missing. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We are our house together. We're the upper house. Well, you're upstairs, so I'll put you the upper house into two. We'll take, we'll take it. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming today to uh, hear a presentation on neonicotinoid research for treated seed in the environment. And um, we appreciate our witnesses, our guests uh, today. And this is uh, a joint hearing with the Senate Agriculture Committee. And our first our first witness is Erica Cummings. Um, and Eric, if you want to identify yourself and uh, for the record, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Erica Cummings, uh, Air Chemical Research and Policy Specialist for my agency of agriculture. So thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. Um, my presentation is titled Neo uh, Evaluation of Neonicotinoid Seed Treatments in the Environment Part 2. So I'm going to, um, over the quick overview, I'm going to go through what neonicotinoids are, why they're used, some of the risks and challenges associated with them. Laura Kleiber um, from Minor Institute is on the phone line and she's going to be talking about a project that we've collaborated on. I have some research updates, some new beehive wax analysis results, and then moving forward. So neonicotinoids are a family of chemicals that are based off of nicotine. And they're popular because they have low mammalian toxicity and they're systemic insecticides, meaning that they are taken into the plant and they persist within the plant tissue. So anytime an insect pest feeds on that plant, the insect dies. So one way in which neonicotinoids enter the state is as seed treatments, primarily on corn and soybeans. The neonicotinoids used on corn are thiamphloxin and clothe anodin, and on soybeans, semitoclocrid. And it was estimated in 2018, we had about 120,000 acres of corn planted in Vermont and 3,000 acres of soybeans. And currently, um, we are getting data for the 2019 seed sold, both um, genetically engineered and also treated seed, the dealers have until February 15th to get us those numbers. Is, if I could ask, is this on paper so that... It, I do, I can send you a, a paper copy, yes. It's, it's on, on our website. website. Well. <laughs> Bobby wants a paper copy. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the purpose of these treatments Ouch. is to protect seed and seedling from insect pests like white grubs, corn seed maggot, and wireworms. And these are just lovely pictures of those critters. <laughs> so what increases pest pressure? So corn seed maggots like manure application, cover crops, old forage stands, weeds, grubs and wireworms like plow down sod, pasture, hay fields, what they all have in common is a light plant cover. When I worked for UVM Extension and we would get calls early in, in the season about uh, corn damage, we would go out and the first thing we would look for is field condition. Were there areas where cover crop or pasture wasn't plowed down? If there was weedy areas, usually the damage coincided with where the plant coverage was remaining. Erica, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, where do wireworms come from? Is there a fly that li lays eggs that creates wireworms? We're not. I'm not. Gary, can you? Can you? <laughs> <laughs> I get you. I can get you that information. Okay. Yeah. Worm, no. <laughs> yes. I'm curious because every once in a while they show up in my chicken coop, and the chickens love them. Mm -hmm. but yeah. You turn over a, a flake of manure or something, and there they are. And, I do believe that they, you know, there's definitely an adult, but I'm not sure what it looks like. Okay. So that Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one of the unintentional consequences with new farming practices to improve water quality is we've created large refuges, refugee, refuges for these in, uh, insect pests. So we have in increased cover crops, increased no-till, and we have increased pest pressure. So the next slide is just some damage. As you can see, we have, um, there's wireworm damage, which is that pretty, like, looks like a snowflake corn leaf, and it can go from minimum to complete decimation of the crop. So some of the challenges 
Pest pressures are hard to predict. The pre-planning uh, scouting protocols that are available right now are very time consuming and their efficacy is still being determined. It's difficult to detect pest damage until the damage is done. And for those of you who are familiar with corn, when a corn plant is down, 99.9% .9 of the time it's not coming back up. There are alternative controls. There are various at planting insecticides that can be applied that could include carbamates, organophosphates, pyrethroids, and neonicotinoids. The problem with these is that they can increase exposure to non-target insects and also human exposure. <coughs> so some of the alternative control me measures, um, I took this from the University of Tennessee and it's funny that the first thing they have listed is chlorpyrifos, which is not registered for use in Vermont anymore. Right. But this gives you a sense of how the application rates to control um, or these pests. And these are amounts at 1,000 foot row. And remember that in, there's 43,560 square feet in an acre. So the next slide just uh, compares how much insecticide that is being applied um, in seed treatment versus in at, um, at planting broadcast application. So significantly more. So uh, the first two uh, in your slide shows that it must be, is there pounds per acre? Do so these are ounces per acre. Ounces per yeah. acre? Yeah. You might want to just read those numbers. Please. Sure. So, um, uh, Poncho 250, with a, which is a clothianidin, um, at 0.25 milligrams per seed, at a seeding rate of 33,000 seeds per acre, which in 30 row spacing, which is standard, you would get 0.29 ounces per acre. If you went with a high rate of Poncho, which is the 1250, which is 1.25 milligrams per seed, same seeding rate, same spacing, you would have 1.46 ounces per acre. Compared with um, Capture, which is a bifenthrin product, um, the range rate is 0.2 to 0.78, and you would be applying um, 8.7 to 34 ounces per acre, depending on the concentration of use. Mm -hmm. So significantly more. So are those comparing different types of the, the table down below is yep. comparing different types of pesticides, yep. or is it comparing, and or is it comparing different types of application? It's different types of application is the primary thing. It's a seed treatment application amount versus a broadcast supply. But there are also different kinds of pesticides, so right. is it both? <laughs> well, so I used um, the rate, it would not be a both, it would be an either or. You would either do an app planting or a seed treatment. And I used um, just one of the products, and um, the range that they put from is 0.2 to 0.70 ounces per thousand foot. foot but do all of the, not all of them can be applied as a seed or a broadcast? Can you go back to the other mm -hmm. table? Sure. Because you have different uh, on the products. Yes. You have different yes. products, and you have so it's unclear what you're trying to compare. So there. I'm just trying to compare the amount of if you were going to apply um, an insecticide as a seed treatment, as a neonicotinoid, it would be that rate. And if you were going to apply another insecticide instead of a neonic, you would be applying a lot higher concentration of insecticide. The, uh, are the other insecticides available as seed treatments? I'm, some I'm, of there are some, okay. and I, uh, we do have one. Um, I'm just trying to figure out if you're doing an apples to apples. Here no, I'm not. I'm just. Okay. It's basically just a comparison of an at plant <coughs> broadcast of applied insecticide versus a seed treatment. That's really what I'm getting at. And so, not all of the alternatives are labeled for seed treatment. The ones that are primarily would be, would be the chlorpyrifos. Yeah, I'm just a stickler for good tables. You've yeah. heard me ask these questions before, so if you're gonna put something on a table, you need to make it consistent across the, the, the categories. <laughs> so I'm gonna briefly talk about environmental benchmarks. They indicate the toxicity levels for different organisms. Acute is a one-time exposure. 
versus a chronic, which is continual exposure over time, which is usually at least 21 days. So as you can see, um, for acute toxicity of imidacloprid, thymethoxam, and clothiathion, we have 0.385 for imidacloprid, thymethoxam is 17.5, and clothiathion is 11. The last product in that table is not a neonicotinoid, but it was used as a seed treatment in 2019 at Minor Institute, and it is chlorantranilaprol. Say that five times fast. Um, and I put it on the list because it does; it is more acutely toxic than the other two seed treatments used to, cover, uh, to treat corn. And for all of the water samples that I'm going to go over the results, we will I'll be using the aquatic invertebrate value because it is the most conservative and also because <coughs> the, close, the closest related to terrestrial insects. And is it going to be all in uh, parts per it will billion? All parts per yeah. billion. Billion. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So well, now... Can I, I was just wondering what vascular and non-vascular plants were. Hmm. So I think non-vascular would be like algae and, and vascular would be like a terrestrial plant. Um, and next up, we have Laura Kleiber on the line from Weiner Institute, which will be talk she'll be talking about a collaborative project we've been working on. Are you there, Laura? All right. Yes. Thank you, Erica. Yep. Uh, so we have uh, Laura Kleiber here from Weiner Institute. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak to you today. Uh, so I'm going to have uh, Erica advancing my slides for me. Um, but so about three years ago, uh, we began collaborating with the agency of ag uh, to take advantage of a field site uh, that we were already monitoring uh, so that we could gain some insight into whether the seed treatments uh, that we were using were making their way into the runoff from these fields. Uh, so we established this site for a six-year NRCS edge of field water quality monitoring study, uh, where for that study, we're measuring the phosphorus, nitrogen, and sediment exports in both the tile drainage and surface runoff. Uh, so we figured uh, it would be a, a great opportunity to take advantage of this site and uh, gain, gain some further information on some water quality metrics. Uh, so the practice we're evaluating uh, for that uh, NRCS project is drainage water management. Uh, this is the practice that allows us to manipulate the tile drainage system uh, in one of these fields, and I'll get to the specifics of that uh, in more detail in a minute. Um, We've been sampling for neonicotinoids for just about three years now. It'll be three years next month. Uh, and during that first year, um, during the first year of sampling, both fields were managed uh, exactly the same. Uh, and then in the second and third years, uh, they continue to be managed the same with the exception that uh, one of these fields is managed with drainage water management. Um, so as far as field characteristics, uh, both have pattern tile systems. Uh, they're spaced laterally at 35 feet uh, and at an average of four feet depth. Uh, the fields are planted with corn uh, that are harvested for silage. Uh, those fields are planted in mid to late May. Uh, and then following harvest, uh, they are less fallow in the winter, uh, so no cover crops. Um, following the corn harvest in the fall, uh, we apply manure and till that in with a disc harrow. Uh, the disc harrow is considered conservation tillage uh, because it does leave quite a bit of plant residue on the surface, uh, which is beneficial for erosion control. Uh, those two, two pictures on the bottom right uh, are roughly equivalent to what the fields will look like uh, following that fall tillage. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here we're looking at a schematic of uh, these research fields. So in the top left, uh, you have the smaller field, field T5, and then sort of that reverse L-shaped field is field T9. Uh, so one field is about four and a half acres, the other is about eight acres. Uh, so the, the purple squiggly lines indicate the general direction of surface runoff in these fields. Uh, the surface runoff is directed to the southern edge of each of the fields, uh, where it flows into a ditch. Uh, which then flows to the corner of the field where we have our monitoring equipment. Uh, and those monitoring locations uh, are represented by those lime green polygons. Uh, the blue vertical lines represent the tile drain lines. Uh, these also flow to the southern edge of the field uh, into a main line, uh, which carries the water to the monitoring equipment uh, that is at the southernmost edge of the site. Um, uh, you can see represented by those pink ovals. Um, the smaller fields, uh, T5, as the field that undergoes uh, the drainage water management. 
treatment. Uh, next slide. Uh, so drainage water management is a practice that allows us to reduce the volume of water that leaves the fields uh, through the tile drainage system. Uh, it works by installing uh, what we call control structures on the main tile outlet from a field. Uh, we can install plates in these structures and those plates uh, forces the water to rise to a higher level in the field uh, before it is able to flow out of that tile system. Uh, so instead of the soil being drained to whatever the depth of the tiles are in those fields, uh, we can adjust it so that anywhere between the depth of the tiles uh, and the soil surface is being drained. Uh, so once we have finished all field activities in the fall, we install the plates uh, so that there is only one foot of uh, soil that is now being drained, um, and we'll keep it at that rate throughout the uh, remainder of the non-growing season. Uh, so in that first picture, uh, you can see how those plates allow the water to uh, back up uh, into the fields uh, before uh, finally cresting those plates and flowing out. Uh, so by doing this, uh, we should be able to significantly reduce the volume of water that is being drained from the fields uh, when we have these plates in place. Uh, then in the spring, about a week or two before the field work starts, uh, we'll remove the plates and allow the tiles to flow freely again uh, so that we can make sure that the field is dry and ready for equipment traffic. Uh, then shortly after planting, uh, those plates get installed again, uh, but this time allowing two and a half feet of drainage uh, since there is a growing crop and we want to make sure uh, that we're not stressing it if there are large rain events. Uh, so then those plates are left uh, in until shortly before harvest. Uh, uh, at which point they're uh, removed so that we can allow the fields to fully drain before we get, uh, get that equipment back out on the fields again. Uh, and then after that harvest, again, uh, loop back to the front and install those plates to one feet for the subsequent non-growing season. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here's some actual pictures to give you an idea of what these structures look like in real life. Uh, in the top left, uh, there's a control structure being installed intercepting that main tile line. Uh, on the right, you can see the installed structure. Uh, typically, they stick out of the ground by about a few feet. Uh, and then in the bottom left, you can see the control structure, uh, which have uh, the two runners going down uh, the sides of those structures where we can insert those plates. Uh, so again, for two of the three years that we've been monitoring, uh, one of the fields, field T5, uh, has been managed uh, with this drainage water management practice. Next slide. Okay, so now we're looking at one of the surface runoff monitoring locations. Uh, so you can see on the right-hand side, that black structure uh, is what we call an H flume. Uh, so all of the surface runoff from the field flows through this flume, uh, and we have equipment that is measuring the height of the water in that flume. Uh, and then we can convert that water height uh, to a flow rate. Uh, and then next to the flume, you can see the sampling hut, uh, which houses all of our monitoring equipment. Uh, the equipment that is continuously measuring the flow of the water uh, can communicate with the automated sampler uh, that we have in that hut uh, so that for, every, for a predetermined amount of flow, uh, a sample is taken. Uh, so for the larger field, that 80-acre 80, 80 field, uh, we're sampling every 3,000 gallons of runoff, and the smaller field uh, is being sampled every 1,600 gallons of runoff. Uh, so every time it samples, it takes about eight ounces of uh, runoff water uh, adds that sample to a large sampling bottle. Um, and so then we go out to the field and retrieve those samples every three to four days. Uh, and so we have a large composite sample that uh, pretty well represents the water quality over that period of time. Um, so by doing, uh, having this type of sampling method, uh, we're able to get a very representative sample of the water that is leaving the field uh, as compared with sampling at preset time intervals. Uh, where we would be sampling low flows uh, at the same frequency as high flows and likely overestimating the influence uh, of those low flow samples. Next slide. So now we're looking at uh, the tile drain flow sampling equipment uh, for one of the fields. Uh, so the equipment is basically all the same. We have the same samplers, uh, the same electronic uh, flow measuring equipment. Uh, we sample at exactly the same intervals, uh, the only difference being how we measure the flow. Uh, so instead of that black H flume, uh, we have a 55-gallon drum you can see down in the uh, bottom portion of the picture. Uh, so this drum has a V-notch uh, cut into the front of it, uh, so that as the water flows into the back of the barrel uh, and the rate of flow increases, uh, the water will rise up higher in that barrel. 
Uh, and then we've developed a relationship between the height of the water in the barrel uh, to the rate of flow, uh, which we'll see on the next slide. Uh, so advance to the next slide. Uh, so here uh, we can see along the horizontal axis we have the height of the water uh, that mistakenly says flume height, that should say uh, barrel height, as, uh, this is for the flow barrels, not the flumes. Um, and then along the vertical axis uh, we have the rate of flow. Uh, so each of those blue points you're looking at on the graph uh, represents uh, a field visit where field measurements were taken of both the height and flow. Uh, and then once we plot all of these points, uh, we can um, plot a best fit line uh, through those points uh, and the equation of that uh, uh, curved line um, allows us to uh, take those water height measurements that we're getting from the field, plug those height measurements into the equation, and then we get a corresponding flow rate. Next slide. Uh, okay, so now I'll just take a minute to look at some flow characteristics from the two fields that we've seen over the past four years. Um, so the, this is from the past four years of the study, um, uh, of the NRCS study. The um, first year we did not sample for neonicotinoids, but then the following three years we have. Um, so the surface runoff flow rate uh, is in blue, uh, the tile flow rate is in red, uh, and I just want to be sure to point out that uh, we do have two different vertical axes on this graph. Uh, so this is because the surface flow rate is so much higher than the tile uh, that we wouldn't be able to pick up much from the uh, tile lines. Um, as you can see, the, the max for the tile uh, for the tile flow rate is about 10 times less uh, than what we see for the surface runoff. Um, however, uh, while those tiles flow at much lower rates, uh, they do flow much more continuously than the surface runoff. Uh, so in the top right, you can see those numbers. Uh, that tile flow generally is responsible for anywhere from uh, 60 to into the 90s percent of the total runoff from the field. Um, and then uh, I also want to point out that the majority of the flow from the field uh, does happen during the non-growing season. So you can see those brackets uh, with NGS above uh, to note those periods of time uh, between October 1st, uh, excuse me, November 1st and April 30th. Um, so typically uh, runoff during the growing season only represents somewhere between uh, 50 to 30 percent of the total annual runoff. Um, this is very common, uh, something we've seen uh, consistently at these sites, but also at um, all of our other uh, research sites that we've monitored at the minor institutes. Um, and it's also well documented in the scientific literature um, in, uh, for studies that are in similar climates as ours. Uh, so this is because with colder temperatures, uh, significant snow melts, uh, and no crop growth to remove water from the soil, uh, the fields are generally much wetter um, and much more prone to generating runoff uh, during these uh, cold weather months. Next slide. Uh, so uh, here is the second field, this is the larger field. Um, and again, we see the same trends that we saw from the first field. Uh, those tile flow rates are much lower, uh, but uh, contributing overall a uh, much greater uh, proportion of the volume uh, for the year. Uh, and again, the majority of the total field runoff is occurring during uh, the non-growing season in this field. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll hand things uh, back over to Eric, who, Erica, uh, who's going to take you through uh, some of the results from uh, the sampling program. <coughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So Ward went through most of the background of the project. I just wanted to point out that in 2017 and 2018, neonicotinoid uh, seed treatments were used. Um, and in 2019, there was a non-neonicotinoid use called Lumuvia, which is that chlorine trans and a little girl. Um, Can you see that again? Uh, <laughs> Chlorotranmiloprol. Sounds like a medication. <laughs> so the results we've gotten thus far from 2017 to 2019, there was 169 subsurface or tile drain water samples analyzed and 29 surface water samples analyzed. 
There were no detections of metoclopril, and all detections of clothianidin and thamethoxin were both low acute toxicity levels for uh, aquatic invertebrates. The detections occurred during planting or in the fall when plant debris was being incorporated. And there were no implications of chronic exposure exceedances. So wait, so just to be clear, what, those are all neonicotinoids that there, the, the, there was no uh, detection of, and that, I'm not going to be able to say these, that's a neonic and the other ones are neonics as so, well. Yes, all, all three of those are neonicotinoids. Okay. So in 2000, uh, from between 2014 and 2019, 382 surface water samples were tested from areas of high agricultural use. During that time, we had one positive detection of imidacloprid, which was below the acute benchmark for aquatic invertebrates. We did see more detections of thymothoxin and clothianidin. As you can see, we had 15 detections of thymothoxin and 18 of clothianidin. Uh, these were all usually during the time of planting, and they were all below the acute toxicity level. Acute toxicity for who? Aquatic for invertebrates. Because aquatic they're the, invertebrates. Yeah, so those are because it's the most restrictive. In 2016, soil samples were taken from four different cropping systems on three different dates and at three different depths, and they were next to tile drain outlets. So in the cornfields, we saw several positive detections of thymophoxin and clopianidin, ranging between 2.08 to 14.13 parts per billion. Most of the detections were in June during planting, and they were in the top 12 inches of soil. In the soybean field, we found one detection of imidacloprid, which was 6.43 parts per billion. And again, it was in the top 12 inches of soil. The question was asked, are neonicotinoids being taken up by non-crop plants? So in 2015 and 2016, vegetation was collected from areas of high agricultural use in Franklin County. The plant primarily collected was goldenrod because it is seen as a late season food source for pollinators. And we had one positive control, which was corn leaves from treated seed. And we had one positive detection, which was the corn leaves. Out of how many acres or tons did you survey? We did, um, it was a, a one farm in Franklin County that there was this study on between 2015 and 2016. I don't know, care if you have more information on the number of uh, sampling sites. I don't have a number of sampling sites with me. This was in and around one field where we were looking at uh, if we could see the migration of neonicotinoids from the field to the tile drainage ditches and into uh, bee forage that was growing in those ditches. And our positive control was the corn that was treated and growing in the field. <laughs> There's really, yeah, but that was the, the only positive position was the, the corn leaves. Wait, can I understand that better? So uh, you're saying it showed up in the corn leaves. Right, but it didn't show up in the non-crop non, non vegetation. Okay, so it wasn't transferred that way. Correct. Um, but isn't, these, these are helpful, do, do these pollinate corn? Not to no. And who sets the toxicity rates? The, the EPA. The EPA? Yep. And what is the toxicity rate for neonic? Is, are there multiple depending on there the are, product? Um, so assuming. for imidacloprid, it's 0.385. For thymothoxam, it's 17.5. And for clothianidin, it's 11 for acute toxicity. <coughs> and it's all parts per billion. So now I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to talk about beehive wax analysis that was done in 2018. It was sponsored by the USDA and the Bee Informed Partnership. Wax was collected from five hives that were sampled twice, once in the spring and once in the fall. The hives were from commercial beekeepers in Addison, Franklin, and Rutland counties. The wax samples were analyzed for 193 different pesticides. 
Out of that, in Vermont, we had 10 reportable levels of pesticides, five of which were found um, are primarily beekeeping <coughs> pesticides. And there were no ne neonicotinoids detected. So <coughs> for the beekeeping um, pesticides, those for, for the varroa mites? Uh, yep. Uh, okay. Next slide. Yep. So there were five uh, varroicides that were detected, amitraz, cumafos, cumafoxacin, fluvalinate, and thymol. And you can see the different detection ranges and the number of positive detections and <coughs> out of five. <coughs> five in the fall. And this is not an apples to apples ratio, it's a different medium, but the aquatic invertebrate toxic acute toxicity benchmark for amitraz is 17.5 and for cumafos it's 0.037 parts per billion. So the additional pesticides that were detected, atrazine was detected uh, in the spring, but we did not see it in the fall. Uh, MBC is a fungicide used in ornamental trees, and diuron is another herbicide. It's a broad spectrum that is also used primarily in landscaping. And it was interesting that the flumaturon is actually a cotton herbicide, and the propergate uh, is an insecticide miticide that was not, there was no registered use in Vermont in 2010 to 2018, so uh, we believe these hives were shipped south and brought back up. That's our hypothesis. <laughs> so in addition, we had 14 unquantifiable pesticide detections. And what that means is they used the term trace, but they did not define what trace meant. So there were trace amounts of these 14 um, different pesticides. There's four fungicides, five herbicides, four insecticides, and one varroicide. And I thought it was interesting that DEEP was one of the insecticides that was in trace quantities. When did we last allow DEEP? We allowed it all the time. Oh, right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, could it be that you're not detecting uh, neonics in the, in the hives because the bees are dying before they get back? I'm not sure. But, you know. And the reason they use wax is because it's thought that the, the pesticides can accumulate over time in the, in the beeswax. But if the bees are dying prior to right. getting back, they, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be touching the wax. Right. So, yep. so how did Vermont do versus the national average? As you can see, we are quite high in um, our bee pesticides. And the one thing that we are um, higher than the, the national average was the fungicide that's used um, primarily in ornamental trees. Well, we're not giving an explanation for that. Why we're higher than others. Uh, it's just there's a lot more use of these different varroicides in, in hives. And I, I would suggest, Senator, that uh, it's harder to keep bees in, in Vermont than it is down south. Um, you know, you can have, say, feral populations of bees in, say, Florida. Uh, we don't have feral or wild populations of honeybees in Vermont anymore. And, it, and if you're going to keep bees in Vermont, you really do need to control the mites. So our beekeepers are <coughs> excessively controlling their mites with legal and <coughs> what we would consider a mis pesticide misuse options. That's what this data sort of demonstrates. Thanks. So <coughs> the of this uh, on this table, which ones are the varroicides? So the 2,4 DMP is the amitraz, uh, the cumafos, the cumafos oxen, the fluvalinate, and the thymol. <clears throat> okay, so all the ones that are really high are varroicides, and the ones that are Correct. low are other types or, or lower, yeah. relatively speaking. Um, okay. The AUC moving forward will continue to monitor waters throughout the state to determine if regulatory <coughs> action is needed. Minor Institute will continue donating their time and resources to increase our data set. And literally three days ago, the EPA proposed new interim registration decisions for neonicotinoids, and that is currently open for public comment. And with that, are there any questions? 
did you report this morning on the difference between surface runoff and tile runoff? I, I didn't include the tile drain data because it was uh, we had no new data for this year. So, so the surface, so the surface water was just the updated surface waters that we had um, analyzed for this year for 2019. But I can get you the um, report from last year. Well, I think we saw the report last mm -hmm. year, but. I think it's real important that we keep tracking that mm -hmm. into the future because it it keeps surfacing that these tile drains are terrible. Right. And right. You know, we need the tests from minor and mm -hmm. other institutions that are non-biased uh, reporting right. so that we can make uh, you know good determinations of whether. Uh, tile drainage is as bad as what we hear, or, is, <clears throat> or as good as what we hear. So the, we hear it both ways. Right. So the 169 subsurface water samples, those are tile drains. So from my yeah. Point, so that is. But I didn't get yeah. any report on. That. Right. Okay. Uh, just to be clear, the the uh, toxicity of the neonics coming out of the tile drains. Is, is a, in a safe level for aquatic insects. It's below the acute toxicity, yes. All right, I just want to relate that to my fly, fly fishing buddies and friends. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I have two questions. Um, what, uh, it, I, it sounds like it was just a couple days ago, but I'm wondering what the EPA recommended or is changing with neonics. And then, um, I maybe I have three questions. Um, what your recommendations are based on this analysis, and then what is is would you make recommendations that would change our oversight of varroicides since those seem to be high in beeswax, uh, or should we not be concerned about that? Sure. I want to let Linda speak to the new uh, neonatal interim registration. This is Linda Bacuzzo from the agency. Hi, <laughs> Linda Bacuzzo. Um, I've only read it over quickly. They did um, suggest some um, change labeling language for um, some of the, not seed treatment necessarily, but other products that are neonicotinoids. Um, there was a, a decision to reduce the um, Clothianidin on bulb vegetables, remove that as a seed treatment option. And um, there are a couple other mitigating factors um, that they proposed, um, and that it is open for 60 days or 57 days now for that. That is as far as I got on that. Okay. Yeah, it just came out and just yeah. two days ago. Yes, yeah. I, I get it. We will dig into that. Um, the other question mm -hmm. about roicides, you did give us authority to sort of regulate the beekeeping industry a little more heavily and we are we're looking more for misuse than we had been in the past based on the data it occurs a lot more often than we thought and then you know the elephant in the room what do we do with this data um, we appreciate this body's uh, authority to regulate treated articles we're the only state in the country currently with that authority I want to use it, Senator. I want to use it, but um, certain folks are holding us accountable. We can't use it unless we demonstrate harm. We're trying to do that. We're looking for the worst case scenarios, and we're not seeing where harm is being implicated. So that's where we are. We're going to keep looking. We've looked at water, both surface and ground. We've looked at vegetation. <laughs> In field and out of field, we looked at soils and, and soil migration, and now we've got you know the ability to actually gauge how much is leaving the field through tile drainage. What I really wanted you to take home from the partnering with Miner is we can calculate a volume that's leaving those fields because she's monitoring these fields so tightly. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's where we are. And, we appreciate the opportunity to keep you guys up to date with where we are. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we have this authority. It'll be interesting to, to implement it when when we can, but we're currently not demonstrating that we need to. And we're... Anthony? 
It's a sort of a policy question, maybe policy slash scientific, I'm not sure which, but you know, you're finding these acceptable levels, and yet in places around the world, these things have been banned or restricted use. I mean, do they find the other evidence in, like in Canada where they restricted use of the neonicotinoids? Nicotinoid, I mean, what are they, what, what, why are we finding such acceptable levels when in fact places, other places are finding unacceptable levels? Doesn't seem to jive. Well, our cropping, our agricultural uh, styles are different. Our soils are different. We've got a lot of organic matter in our soils where you're, where you're finding issues with these. The, the acreages that get planted are larger. There's less organic matter in the soils. And then your depth to, to groundwater is also different. So we're talking Midwest or I, I'm not familiar with, uh, with European style agriculture, but uh, if this body wants to send somebody from the agency over, we'll check it out. I'll walk with you. Well, I would expect, picking up on that, that, you know, back in the 20s and 30s, it was the Dust Bowl out west because they basically ruined their topsoils. And, and uh, so their topsoils are pretty thin compared to our top soils here in in the northeast and you know you take our forages we grow more forages per acre than than out there the only way they beat us is because they do four five six crops well that that strips their soils of their nutrients and their their filtering capacities and um, you know, we're pretty fortunate that we have good ag practices and, and more so, we're fortunate that we've had farmers over the decades that took care of their soils. I have a follow-up question. Uh, so uh, I appreciate that you're able to give us actual real data, not just model data. So, you know, I, I appreciate that you showed us the methodology that you use to get actual data. Um, and I, I get, just to follow up on my question about the varroa sites, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, that you're not finding the levels of toxicity, perhaps in neonicotinoids, but maybe in other areas. And so this has been my question all along, Carrie, is, you know, what, what are the things that we are, what are the things that you're finding in higher levels than we should be comfortable with, that we should maybe, maybe it's not neonics, I don't know, um, but maybe it's something else. And, you know, what does, you know, overall in our usage of pesticides and herbicides in the state, what, what are the concerning areas that you're finding through this data? Maybe we're not asking about the right ones. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what are the right ones that we should be looking at. And then I also have a concern about always following the EPA toxicity recommendations. I know that those are the best you have, but as we found out last year, with lead levels in drinking water for students in our schools, their <laughs> levels of lead were much more, uh, much higher and much, uh, you know, less health-based and concerning, and we took our levels down way mu much, much lower. So the EPA is not necessarily on the case for this stuff very, uh, very much, and they are backing away from a lot of their stricter standards even. So always following the recommendations of the EPA may not be what we want to do in Vermont. So, so yeah. yeah. So sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, there is, I, sorry, there are so many questions. I know, I'm, I'm just, backwards. I'm high maintenance, but come on. <laughs> I would like so the, the lead levels and the other levels, the PFOA levels that are established by EPA, they're established outside of FIFRA, and FIFRA is the Federal Insecticide Rodenticide Act, which is bound to the Food Quality Protection Act, which in the Food Quality Protection Act is where those standards get set. The lead level, the PFO, PFOA levels, those are, those are set differently, and those are based on different criteria than the pesticide levels that are established with the Food Quality Protection Act, which 
has to include health values and they have to get reevaluated for every active ingredient every 15 years. And they're using all the data available. Um, so there is, I understand you. 15 years is a long time when it comes to science. Not when you're, so those, yeah, well, I'll go over the schedule with you. Um, and that 15 years was the impetus behind us arguing for the ability to regulate treated articles. When EPA found out that uh, copper chromated arsenic or pressure treated wood was an issue, it took EPA 15 years to get that out of the market with the ability to regulate treated articles to just demonstrate harm and remove that from the marketplace for the monsters. So we do have flexibility here that EPA doesn't have, and I can go over the schedule with you. Uh, the re-registration schedule, um, the reason that it takes 15 years is the amount of active ingredients in there on a constant cycle. Um, you know, the triazines review, they lumped atrazine, simazine, cyanazine, all into one package. That review took 10 years, so in five years that needs to be re-reviewed. Re okay, so based on the data you have, are there things that we're missing that we should be paying attention to? I think not with regard to treated seeds, um, and those are conversations that I think we can have. Um, outside of talking about neonics. I know you've, you've asked before, I'd be glad to come in and chat, um, go over some of the use data, what we're seeing, the data that was presented here that amitraz, you know, chlorpyrifos is an organophosphate, amitraz is also an organophosphate. The only use left, left for amitraz is for use in hives. I think they've eliminated everything else. And uh, in hives and on the back of cattle, um, are the only two uses for amitraz. Um, there are no food uses. It's a not. It's not so. The chemist, the tox package associated with amitraz is more concerning than than some of the other minocides. Thymol is thyme oil, so I'm less concerned about the high levels of thymol than I do about amitraz. Um, they just brought amitraz back for use as a in hive miticide two years ago. That use had been eliminated, um, but the beekeepers uh, begged and pleaded for another tool to control mites. And prior to that, beekeepers were misusing amitraz. They would go and buy this cattle, cattle um, spray on treatment, dip something in it and stick that in the hive. So the, we have seen amitraz carry through the honey. Um, and when we did, it was a misuse. So if, there, if tools aren't available, people will use <coughs> tools that aren't available. Can you remind us that, that to, um, to plant treated seeds, do, do, they, is it, do we consider that like a pesticide the same way that there's treated? We don't. There was some consideration at EPA to register a treated seed as a pesticide, but it's currently considered a treated article. The application takes place in St. Louis or wherever the seed is manufactured, gets shipped to Vermont as a treated article, and you don't need an applicator license to, to plant that seed. Just a seed. And, and um, so nobody has to demonstrate any need, right? They, they just, if that's what they want, they can go buy it and plant it, correct? Correct. And what about for other pesticides that people do have to go through, they have to get licensed to apply, they have to be a licensed applicator, right? They have to have some training to be following the direction. But even there, do they have to prove a need, or they just, once we believe that they're going to do it responsibly? It, it depends on our level of regulation, and if they're doing it through a permit program that the agency runs or not. Um, the golf courses, for instance, there's a written in the, every golf course in Vermont needs a permit in order to use pesticides on that golf course. 
and there are IPM protocols built into their permitting. Um, but if you're not operating under a permit, IPM isn't required. What's, uh, I, what's IPM? Sorry, integrated pest management. I thought that's what you were asking. Well, about. I was, but I <laughs> yeah, completely <laughs> forgot. Yeah. 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 Sorry, so proof that you need to use a pesticide. Um, it's usually an economic driver. Um, you see a pest. A lot of the farms do implement IPM um, for insecticide use, but it's not a requirement, but it usually is financially, financially driven. When you're talking about that, other uses, you know, hospitals use a disinfectant. We don't make them prove that there's MRSA on the counter. They can go ahead and use a disinfectant, right? And we also mandate those uses without proof that there's a pathogen that needs to be killed. So it depends on what sort of use pattern you're talking about, whether or not IPM or <coughs> triggers are used. Um, you know. So uh, the other, go ahead. The other earlier this week or tail end of last week, I read a report. Uh, I think probably most people in the room about our atrazine uptake and how we're using a tremendous amount of that. And then there was, in that same story, there was something to the effect that we have a, um, a manufacturer of certain products in the state. They're using uh, one of these uh, herbicides or something. In a, and that's what drove the number up. Uh, is that is that accurate? Or? It, it is. Yeah, they, that uh, is data that the agency published on our our website. That it took years for us. I mean, Eric has been working on that data for over a year, um, getting it as best uh, the best data set we could, um, and it's. <laughs> It tells lots of different stories. Um, looking at the atrazine data, to me, it, it kind of looks flat. It, well, I thought we were headed away from using atrazine in reports that I've read in prior years, but this showed an intake in the so we're yeah. So we're looking at a snapshot. If you go back to the mid-'90s, when the federal government cut the rate of atrazine in half, we used half, we're using half of what we did 15 years ago, but we're only looking at 10 years worth of data. And it's been pretty flat. It's roughly around 80,000 pounds of atrazine. But if you did the math, what could be used on our corn ground, just I'll make it easy. We got about 100,000 acres of corn. At <clears throat> the label rate for atrazine right now is the upper label rate is three pounds per acre. So we could potentially see 300,000 pounds of atrazine get used and still be legal. But we're at 80. We're at 80, and that's because the cocktails that are being offered, there, there's the current um, sort of weed management options are a mix. The Lumax is, is popular right now, and it's a mix of mesotrium, <coughs> atrazine, and metolachlor. Um, that's what people are using, what people have found effective. Um, I did appreciate in the article that they asked Jeff Carter a lot of the questions, and I didn't have to answer them, so <laughs> I think it would be appropriate to have extension answering some of those questions. But Well, I thought of having Jeff come in yeah. uh, uh, maybe next week. Uh, we're going to have some testimony on this. and. So if we work toward cutting that 80,000 pounds, uh, you know, say by 10, 12 percent, uh, I mean, I, I'm wondering if that would be possible and still allow crops to grow. Yeah. So atrazine's got an 18-month plant back restriction, which means it's active in the soil for a year and a half. So you're working on that? No, but as we incentivize cover cropping and no-till, you're going to see people shifting away from atrazine use because 
it's detrimental to those covered lands. So if we keep incentivizing those, the conservation tillage and other mm -hmm. practices, we will see atrazine use decline. It will go down. Mm -hmm. But we, we need to understand that because Rodney's the only one that grows probably anything other than a garden and yeah, grass field. Um, and um, so you know we need we need that uh, you do grow. Yeah, you grow. So I have a question. <laughs> um, um, so I'm interested about the high levels of uh, amitraz and as a peroxide and in the wax. So I use, for my hives, I use Apolife Bar, mm -hmm. and I think the other one is Formic Pro. And where does that fit in? Is, are, is that any of that? The Apolife Bar? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll look at the label, because I could say what I think it is, but I might be wrong. Okay. So, but what's Formic Pro? Is Formic that Acid. And formic acid leaves no residue. Okay. So formic acid is basically the acid that the ants generate, and it uh, yes. works to drive the mites out of the hive. Okay. So I'll continue to use that. That's dogs. Um, the tile drainage monitoring, the grass look like you are monitoring all year round. And this equipment looks like it would be really unhappy if it freezes. How do you protect the equipment? Laura, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Could you answer that question? Did you hear it? Uh, could, could you repeat it, please? I think I heard the first half. <laughs> the tile drainage monitoring equipment, how is it kept protected from freezing? It doesn't look like it would be happy at all if it froze. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually it's fairly uh, hardy, but we do have, so um, the, the picture where we were looking at where we saw that uh, flow barrel and some of that equipment um, is in a manhole, and so it's down there probably seven or eight feet uh, below the ground surface. Uh, so we do have some sort of geothermal uh, warming that uh, helps to keep those things warm. Uh, additionally, what you didn't see was that we now have a, um, a shed that's around that uh, where we're able to keep the wind, uh, keep the wind down in there, um, and we put styrofoam plugs over the top of those manholes. Uh, so we can retain uh, the majority of that geothermal energy. Uh, and then just for good measure, uh, we do have power at these sites. Uh, so we run some heat tape, uh, which provides some uh, additional uh, heat around the more sensitive areas and, and keeps things from freezing up. Uh, so we are able to um, confidently uh, collect that data year round. Thank you, Doc, for bringing that up. <laughs> Now we know like the that. rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? John, historically, were there um, what did farmers do to diminish the, the, the effects of, of the maggots and the wireless? And in places where Amex now have been restricted or banned. On corn, we use crow oil and yeah. cultivator set. So Lindane, horses. Lindane, which was organic chlorine, then that was replaced by organophosphate insecticides. And currently, the chlorotronella parole is an option uh, for seed treatment. So what percentage was, was getting killed off before pesticides? Was it, you know, your whole corn crop's gone, or was it always like 15% or 20%? No, let me put up this. So I've never grown field corn myself. Yeah, so that middle photo is a pretty good representation of the damage you can expect. So on the, on the plus side, it must have, you know, by 10 or something, increased corn yields. I think that number is 6%, and that's, a, that's yeah. from pioneer seed. All right.
Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Thank you all. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's a very presentation. Good report. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's good.